are going to continue with our series, I believe, uh, Sunday, and uh, we're getting into our second sermon. We're going to be talking about why I believe in life after death. So if you have those uh, notes in your bulletin, I encourage you, pull them out. Uh, I was reading in uh, the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, and I'm going to look it up for you just, just to start off this morning because these verses really encouraged me this morning. First uh, Peter chapter three verse fifteen was uh, was a verse that, that really just spoke to me, popped out to me this morning. It said, "But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always be being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect." There's, there's three things that that just jumped out to me as I read those this morning. But in your hearts, consider Christ as the Lord, okay? Who is our Lord? Our nation, our country, the decisions they make? No, it's our God. He's, he's the one that we are to consider high above all. Uh, and then it says, always being prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you. That's the reason why we're doing this series. Uh, a lot of people come to us with, with questions. Why do you believe this? Why do you believe that? Uh, and the answer is because it's found in God's word. Now, do we know where to find it or do we support that? Not all the time. That's, that's where, it, where it gets a little harder. And we need God's help as, as we develop ourselves, as we teach ourselves those things. But uh, the other thing that popped out to me was this. We're not to bash God's word over people's heads. We're not to, we're not to be all high and mighty over them when we're telling them what we believe and how they're so wrong. No, it says, but do this with gentleness and respect. So I hope that uh, as we go through this series, as we look at different things that, that are foundational for our faith, we learn how we can defend our faith in this way, that, that we not use it as a club to beat people over the head with, but that, uh, that we do this with gentleness and respect for, for those that, that don't know the Lord, that are blind to the truth of God's word. So let's, uh, let's just get started and, and uh, have a word of prayer as we get going. God, we are so grateful that we can be here in your house. Lord, uh, you have just given us this beautiful day. And uh, Lord, it's, it's another busy week that we have coming upon us as a church. And so Lord, I pray that you would lead and guide us forward, that you would provide uh, strength for those that are helping with Vacation Bible School and those, those that have yet to make a decision to just come out and volunteer, Lord. I pray that you'd provide everyone that's needed. Lord, at this time, would you call in those kids and, and those families to come here, Lord. Lord, as, as we talk about, Lord, why we believe that there is life after death, God, I pray that you'd confirm this in our hearts, Lord. If, if there's any root of doubt within us, within our minds, I pray that, Lord, you'd, you'd use your word today in a powerful way to speak truth into our lives, that we might be able to use it to proclaim to the world pray this in Jesus precious name amen well we've been uh, in our Wednesday night Bible study studying a uh, king that uh, was probably one of the most well-known wisest men in, in all of the, the world okay his name was Solomon and in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 he said this he has made everything beautiful in his time and also he has put eternity into man's heart. Think about that. Think about what he just said. He said, God has placed a longing for eternity into every man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. My shirt's coming apart because of this mic. You're seeing all my chest here. I apologize. <laughs> I wasn't trying to be a Fonzie or anything like that. So. <laughs> But what Solomon is saying here is he's the wisest man on this earth. He, he's, he's the richest man probably of all time. And, and he's, he's saying that, that God has placed eternity into his heart. Okay, he is a man that, that probably was able to, to if, you, if you just think about it, uh, be able to experience every conceivable uh, way of potential satisfaction on this earth, in this, in this world, okay? He was rich. He had a lot of money. He built a palace that amazed the kings that surrounded uh, him, the world leaders. He, he accumulated massive amounts of possessions, chariots, armies, 
he, he went uh, deep, deep, deep into advanced studies. He uh, had hundreds of wives. He, he had a different woman to sleep with every single night. Now, at the end of that, all those things all put together, he came away with tears and frustration, and he concluded this. He says in Ecclesiastes 2, he said, So I hated my life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me. For all is vanity, a striving after the wind. See, he discovered what so many of us fail to realize, that this life is just an endless cycle of endless toil, doing the same thing over and over and over again. The world promises us fulfillment, joy, satisfaction, and we seek it, taking on different projects, pursuing different things. Yet, does it really satisfy? No. Solomon said it's all vanity. Nothing that he could create, buy, build, could ever give him happiness or true satisfaction. And that's why he concluded in Ecclesiastes 3, he's put eternity into the hearts of men. So what's he really talking about? What he's saying is that, he's, is that there's got to be something more, right? There's got to be something more. If I have this deep, deep, deep sense that, that, that I want to be fulfilled, I want to have happiness, joy, success, and I can't get it here on this earth, it's got to be achieved in eternity, right? He was looking for it, but he couldn't find it on his own. He couldn't find it apart from God. I heard a quote by James McDonald. It's a pastor over in Chicago. He said, the underlying vacuum in the center of every soul is a manufacturer's specification from God himself. He's the one who has placed eternity in our hearts, and only he can fill it. That's a basis that I want to set this morning as we talk about eternity, as we talk about the afterlife, is one of the big reasons why we can know that there is an afterlife is because God has placed eternity in our hearts. Solomon so eloquently said. So we're going to learn reasons why, why we can know it. We're going to look at evidence from this world that points to it, but we're going to actually look more in depth at evidence from God's word and what heaven and hell are like. So that's where we're going this morning. What we know, if, if we're asked the question, if there is, is there life after death, what we know is that 100% of people die. Now, we might want to uh, put a couple exceptions with Jesus and uh, with Elijah that was raised up in a fiery chariot, but uh, there, there's not many people that have had that experience. But we know 100% of people die. Every one of you sitting right here is going to die within the next 100 years. Maybe not Abby, <laughs> if she lives. To, I, heard, I saw a 110-year-old vet on, on the news this week. That was amazing. Did you see her? Yeah, she looked pretty cool. But we know that 100% of us die, right? How do we know what's after that? How do we know that there is, there is heaven or there is hell? Well, we're going to look at some evidences today. Uh, we're going to start with, with some evidences from the world, and uh, we're going to look at those here this morning. Let's start off with nature, okay? These are, these are things that we can just find in our world. Nature. Uh, Plato, he said this. He said, I'm not sure what is after death. He wasn't sure. But nature seems to give us a picture of what it would be like. And what he was referring to was that, that uh, you look at any piece of fruit and uh, you open it up and what do you see inside? There's a seed or there's seeds. There's thousands of seeds. And if you plant that seed, you get the tree from which that fruit grew. So what he's saying is, is that uh, there's this sense of eternity within that. The sense that th there is something more, that death is the end. Anthropology. If you're not familiar with this word, it's, it's the study of man. Uh, there's many anthropologists that have studied all the cultures of this world, and what they've concluded is that every single culture on the face of this earth no matter when they existed, believed or believe that there is some type of afterlife. That's anthropology. Psychology says this. We have this innate inner longing. There's got to be something more, like, like Solomon referred to. 
we have this thirst for meaning, we have this thirst for significance, for purpose, and it never gets satisfied. Why? Because we try to do it apart from God, apart from knowing that there's something more. That's psychology. Ethics is, is very interesting. Ethics says this, morality demands justice. Evil should be punished. Good should be rewarded. But guess what? It's not happening. Life isn't fair. Good people suffer. And evil people prosper. You remember what David said in, in that psalm? Uh, he, he was, he was just, just loathing about how the, the evil people were prospering, how they had everything that they needed. And there is David suffering. And he, he's, you know, he's, he's thinking that he's good. And, and uh, he, he knows God. He believes in God. And, and he gets down to verse 17 of, of Psalm 73. And he, I, I'll never forget these words. He says, until I entered the sanctuary of God and I understood their final destiny. The argument for justice. God, in the end, he's going to balance those two out. So eternity is needed. Philosophy says this. Philosophically, Immanuel Kant said, said uh, philosophically, you need to have an afterlife because if there is morality and if there is purpose, then you need to have justice. Okay, that's a lot like what ethics just said. Uh, fact is, life's not fair. Uh, bad things happen to good people. And in the end, God will balance those scales. So philosophically, you need to have an eternity to, to deal with this issue of morality, good, bad. Uh, why, why do we think that there is a right and a wrong? This is interesting. You may have heard this before. Uh, science actually talks about uh, what we call near-death experiences. Did you know that there are nearly 8 million Americans that claim to have had a near-death experience? And uh, there were scientists that, that uh, got together, two of them in particular, and, and, and they said, okay, what, what are we talking about when we, when we say that, that someone has had a near-death experience? And what they said was, well, uh, it's when it stops beating and when the brain waves stop, stop, stop functioning, when, when the brain is no longer... Uh, functioning in that way. And so uh, this uh, scientist named uh, Ring and another one named Savon, they, they did their own interviews of people that, that qualified for near-death experiences. And this is what they came up with. 16% of the people that went through a near-death experience experienced some kind of light. 23% experienced a tunnel of darkness. And Savon was was a little bit different. He said that 28% experienced darkness and 23% experienced light. So I think that's kind of interesting because it, it points to that, that obviously people are, are seeing something after they have died. Something was going on. They still had this sense of consciousness. Not, not that like if their brain, their brain waves stopped functioning, you'd think, okay, there'd be nothing, right? There was still something. They still had consciousness to them. That they realized that something was going on. They saw light. They saw darkness. And so these are some proofs. Last one, but certainly not the least, probably the greatest proof that there is life after death is Jesus himself. And we'll go more into depth with this later on, but uh, there is one person out of all things, all other movements that has ever claimed to have come back from the dead. And that is Jesus Christ. That he was crucified on a cross. He was brutally beaten. He died. He was a spear stuck into his side. He physically died and he was buried. He was, he was in a tomb for three days. He rose again. And he appeared to people over a period of 40 days. He appeared to over 500 witnesses on 12 different occasions. And he told people, you need to prepare for the afterlife. So if you take all these seven evidences, these are just things from our world. We didn't even hardly touch on the Bible yet. If you take the cumulative evidence of all these, don't they point to that there is something more? That there is eternity? That there is life after death? I want to establish. Uh, if you're taking notes today, here's where I want you to start. 
uh, we're going to look into God's word and, and examine exactly what God's word teaches about life after death. First uh, thing that, that I want to do is just is explain statements that, that you're going to write down are just broad summary statements of what most people believe the Bible teaches, what, what I think we could all agree on. And uh, we're going to point to you uh, scriptures that, that talk about all these things. So the first one that, that we're touching on is this. Number one, that at death, every person's soul, spirit enters immediately and consciously into the relational aspects of eternal existence. Now what's interesting is that uh, Jesus himself, he, he made this very clear from the words of Christ himself. He said this in, in Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31. He said this, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covering his sores. He desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger into the water and cool my tongue, for I am in, I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. Then he said, Then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, They do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced someone should rise from the dead. Was Jesus right? Yes, he was. He himself rose from the dead. And were they convinced? No. Okay, I want you to just keep your Bibles open to that place. I want you to examine a couple things that, that Jesus says about eternity. There are how many possibilities? Two. Heaven and hell. There's, there's specifically the way Jesus said, a place of paradise and a place of of torment. And uh, are you just incognito out of it while you're there? No, you're not. You're conscious. You can talk. You can you you know what's going on. You can feel pain. You can feel joy. But can you go between the two? No. You can't. There's a great chasm that has been fixed that they can't go over there. People from, from the place of torment can't come over to the place of paradise. That's how Jesus described it. Once someone dies, there's no second chance. This man was saying, well, if there's no second chance, send someone back to, to my family to warn them. I have a feeling that, that every single one of our relatives that, that has passed on from this life is saying the exact same thing. Please, tell my family. Warn them. I can't tell you how many times I've done done a funeral and, and uh, I, I'd rather honestly do a funeral than I would a wedding because uh, there's still hope for those that are around uh, there is there's still uh, something that the decisions that can be made that are serious the Bible says it's better to go into a house of mourning than into a house of feasting right well I think that's the kind of idea that Jesus gave here this is a serious thing. There's only two choices. There's only two, two places to go, the place of paradise or the place of torment. And so we know that everyone's soul or spirit enters immediately and consciously into 
the relational aspects of eternal existence. That's number one. Number two is this. Every person will one day be resurrected and live forever. We get this from Acts chapter 24. It's uh, verses 14 and 15. It says this. This is uh, Paul. He's giving his testimony to Agrippa. He's making a defense for his faith. And he says this. But this I confess to you. That according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everyone, everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. What's Paul saying? He's saying resurrection is happening to everybody. No matter what you believe, you're going to be resurrected one day. Everyone lives eternally. That's one thing we always remember when when we bring a new life into this world. We're not just bringing a life into this world for 70, 80 years. We're bringing an eternal being that's immortal forever. Think about that. Everyone is going to live forever. There's going to be a resurrection for the righteous, and there's going to be a resurrection for the wicked. But in Whatever the case, everyone will be resurrected either to that place of paradise or to that place of torment. Number three, keep things moving, says that uh, every person will be judged and granted the extended capacity to fulfill in eternity the deepest yearnings and desires of their hearts while they were on earth. Hebrews 9 verse 27, we see... uh, that it says, just as a man is destined to die once and after that to face the judgment. Judgment is coming. Everyone is going to appear before God and is going to have to give an account. Jesus himself, he said this, I tell you the truth, the time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the son of man. So judgment, it's universal. There are no second chances. Jesus is the judge. And this judgment is going to be based on what did you do with my son? What did you do with this message of salvation? Did you receive it? Did you accept it as I called you to it? Did you reject it? Now I'll tell you what happens. The point of Point in this point number three is that uh, said said that everyone will be granted this extended capacity to fulfill the deepest yearnings of their heart in eternity, right? And then what this means is this: when you die, if your if your deepest longing while you were on earth was about your fulfillment, your own pleasure, your own stuff, you're in control. I don't want to be near God. I don't want to be around his people. I don't want anything to do with God's word for sure. And I don't want him telling me what to do. If your deepest yearnings were about you, yourself, your money, your time, your pleasure, I want to distance myself from God, guess what? God so honors your free will and your own choice that in eternity he will grant you that extended capacity to distance yourself as far away from God as possible. God is not there. He's not in hell. Separation from God. If you don't want to be around him on this earth, if you don't want to have anything to do with him, it's your choice. You're choosing in eternity to live your life separated from God. What a horrible existence. Now, take it the other way. If by contrast your deepest desire was to draw near to God, to be around his people, to know more and more about Jesus, to be changed day by day, to to worship him and honor him. Then in heaven, guess what? You're going to be granted that extended capacity too. It's a pretty awesome thing. God will be there. We'll be able to worship him. We'll be able to surround ourselves with people that that know God, that have have obeyed him, that that are following him and and that desire for his glory. And we're going to be falling on our faces and worshiping God. That is eternity. 
when we die, we'll have that extended capacity to know him more, to enjoy him more, to experience the life that he gave. God's sovereign. That's, that's what he is. And he allows us that choice. Does he know in advance? Yes, he does. Explain to me how that works. I can't tell you. But he allows us that free will at the same time. To either choose him or to reject him. No amount of good works can ever get you into heaven. That free gift has been offered. It's open to all. It's what Christ did on the cross. The moment he died, he gave us that capacity to experience that extended capacity to relationship with him or rejection of him. It's our choice. That's number three. Well, number four, what, what else does the Bible teach? Lastly, it says this, that every person will spend eternity in heaven with Christ and fellow believers or in hell separated from God forever. Now, doesn't, doesn't that sound harsh? You know, you, you probably have heard it all your whole, your whole life, and you're like, okay, yeah, I, I know it. You know, but, but probably to someone that doesn't know the Lord, it sounds like, who are you to say something like that? I'm, I'm a pretty good person. Well, it came from actually the most loving person that, that existed on the face of this earth. Jesus himself said these things. He said in Matthew 25, verse 46, he said, Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Jesus also said, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes in him has eternal life, and he will not be condemned. He is crossed over from death to life. So our eternal destiny is, again, either heaven or it is hell. Eternity with God or separation from God forever. Now, begs the question then of uh, what is heaven like and what is hell like? These are, these are some interesting things we get into because uh, probably one of my biggest pet peeves uh, when someone dies is when people write all over Facebook that, oh, this person, uh, my, my Uncle Joe is, is in heaven. He's got his wings now. He's flying with the angels. Is that true? You show me a scripture in the Bible that says we become angels. We don't. We don't. The angels are their own beings. We don't become one. But uh, when we look at heaven, we get lots of, lots of different ideas of what it's like from Scripture. And I'm just going to give you a little preview. If you, if you uh, want to look in the book of Revelation, we're in chapter 21, and it's verses 1 through 5. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 5, talk about what heaven is like. It's saying this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall be, there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy, and they are true. Over and over again in that passage, among other things, you see the, the main thing that's focused on is God is there. He is there. He is reigning. He has made his dwelling place with men. That is the best part of heaven. Forget the gold, forget the pearly gates, whatever you might be looking forward to seeing in heaven. Forget about it. God is there. He's why we want to go there. Now, there's also talked about in Revelation chapter 4. If you look over there a couple couple pages back, you see Revelation chapter 4 verses 1 through 4 that there's there's beauty, there's light, there's warmth. In verse 4 it says this, after this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here. I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a 
throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne, and he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. Around the throne was a rainbow that had an appearance of an emerald. Around the throne, around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on those thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. If you skip over to chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, you, you see some other passages that talk about what heaven is like. Chapter 22, verses 1 through 5 says, Then an angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright and flowing from the throne of God and from the Lamb, through the middle of the streets of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of each tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer would there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. The night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun. God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. See all these awesome things? There's going to be wonderful relationships, Hebrews 12. There's going to be incredible accommodations, John 14. There's going to be a fresh start. We're going to have a new nature, 1 John 3, a new body, 2 Corinthians 5. We're going to have a new vocation, Revelation 22. Some of us that experience pain, sadness, it's not going to be there. It's going to be over. We're going to be really excited about that. There's going to be complete rest. There's going to be protection, contentment, security, peace, purpose, unbridled joy, celebration, worship, laughter, music, learning, growing, fellowship, worshiping, serving, eating. I think you like that one. Discovering the infant majesty of God in this universe, and it's going to be forever. See, that's desi God's desire for every single person. That's God's desire for us. Some people say, how could God throw someone into hell? How could God be so mean to do something like that? It's not his desire. His desire is that all be saved, that all come to, to know him, that all come to the good side of life. But unfortunately, some people choose hell. What is hell like? Let's look at that before we close. Preview of hell is this. God is not there. First Thessalonians 1 verse 9 says this. It is isolation, solitary confinement. Do you know that that's the kind of punishment that they use in wars? It's the worst type of punishment there is. There's punishment. There's torment. Revelation 14. There's utter darkness. Matthew 8. There's weeping. Matthew 8 verse 12. There's wailing. Matthew 13. There's gnashing of teeth. And it's we could go all, go on and on and on about this. But hell was created because God so valued our free will, our choice, to either choose him or to reject him, that this place exists because he wants us to love him genuinely. C.S. Lewis, he said this, if you don't have the opportunity to say yes or no, the choice God has given us a choice. God has given us an opportunity to either accept him or to reject him. God's desire is that we spend eternity with him. That's his desire. So to review, we looked at some seven evidences that made a pretty good case that there is life after death. We looked at the evidences in the Bible, the summary statements that at death, every person's soul Spirit enters immediately and consciously into the relational aspects of eternal existence. That every person will one day be resurrected and, and live forever. And number three, every person will be judged and will be granted that extended capacity to fulfill in eternity their deepest yearnings and desires of their heart while on earth. And number four, every person will spend eternity in heaven or talked about heaven 
pretty wonderful place to talk about hell. Pretty terrifying place. My question to you as we close is this. Will your future be blissful or will it be the most terrifying thing you can ever imagine? What is it? Are you absolutely certain that if you were to die today, walk out these doors and have a massive heart attack, that you would be ushered consciously into the presence of God? Do you believe that? Or are you not sure? Today's the day to make sure you're right with God. Make sure you've received His Son. If you know that, that you will, praise God. But if you don't, this moment, say, Lord Jesus, I've never seen it so clearly before as this. Lord, seeing what this place of paradise is and this place of torment, God, I, I don't want to go there. God, I believe that you died on the cross to save me, to take the punishment for my sin that I deserve to pay for on my own. God, forgive me. I want to be your child. I want to be with you in eternity. I don't want to keep on rejecting you here on this earth and eternally be separated from you in heaven. If you know, if you pray those things, if you, if you believe those things in your heart, Jesus says he'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. He'll save you. His spirit will take up residence in your body. You can be his son or daughter, and you can begin eternal life today. Believe it. We're going to live etern eternally one way or the other. Do you want to spend it away from God or do you want to spend it with him and see him? So that's my call as we close. This is something that's very serious, something that, that we don't think about very often. Often we just live our lives kind of like Solomon, don't we? we? We live our lives thinking, pursuing, pursuing the things of this earth, thinking that they'll bring us joy and pleasure, yet we always come up short, right? Because there's eternity eternity that God has placed in our hearts. Where are you going? As we close our service uh, and as we sing a hymn, as we close, I'm going to invite you if you want to receive Jesus as your Savior, want to learn more about, about him, uh, come on forward. Or, or if you're embarrassed to come forward during the service, just come and talk to me after. I'd love to talk to you. I have some things I want to give you that, that, you, that you can read and be assured more of your faith. I was there at one point. I was there where I didn't know. And I come to that place where I, I believe, I believe. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful, God, that, Lord, you've created with that, within us this desire for eternity. Lord, uh, we don't want to be those people that are going to be found on, on the wide road that leads to destruction. Lord, we want to be found on that narrow road. God, you say there's few that find it. Lord, help us to believe that, that Jesus, your sacrifice for us was sufficient. Stop trusting in ourselves for our own salvation, our own eternity, our own good works, Lord. We know from this earth we come up short. Lord, even because, because we're never satisfied. Just that fact. God, you're not satisfied with what we do. Lord, this Jesus is satisfied bringing us to be pure, righteous, before you, and we're going to get it. God, I pray that if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, God, that, that at this moment, the Lord, you would be, you'd be working in them, Lord, that you would be calling them to yourself, Lord, that they would know today before they walk out of this room, Lord, they're going to be with you. Lord, I pray this all. Thank you, God, for the work that you're about to do this week in our church, Lord, through all our efforts. God, it's your spirit that's, that's working in people's hearts, and we trust you, God, to do your work. In Jesus' name, amen.